Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom or Tom. How's it going? Tony, hotel check-in day is only, what, like four or five days away? How do you think I'm doing? <laughs> Pretty darn good. Hotel check-in day, one of the great traditions, mysteries, um, shames of the Ohio state beat, uh, started many, many years ago by the late great Jim Davidson taking photos of the Buckeyes checking in. And then uh, it would blow up on the internet and other outlets would be like, we should probably go do that next year. And so then, then a couple more. And then, then eventually the newspapers had to come over and do it. And I'm sure like the newspaper people probably hated it and they still hate it, but because everybody's there, Everybody has to be there. And yes, it is. It, it's, it's tradition. It's one of the great. I, is, it, is it the greatest Ohio State football tradition? Script Ohio. Check-in day. I don't know. It might be the most unique Ohio State tradition, because I think even other places that are crazy for football, I think, you know, even Alabama you know, Alabama or Auburn, where, you know, they're poisoning each, other, poisoning each other's trees and, uh, you know, all that crazy nonsense. Even they're like, wait, you do what? You do you, you what? <laughs> and it feels, this is the Ohio State Beats version of, like, when your parents would say, you know, well, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it? It's like, well, if they're getting pictures of Ohio State football players, uh, then I probably would have to jump off the bridge just for competitive reasons, because if everyone else is jumping off that bridge, it would be pretty silly not to be there jumping off the same bridge as well. So it is, uh, it's one of those things that I think everyone there kind of recognizes is like, this is kind of weird, uh, but it is just, it has become a, it has become over the last 20 years, a tradition. I remember doing it 2002. I remember being there. Uh, for hotel check-in day when, you know, the incredible freshman class and Justin's Wick and Mike D'Andrea and all those guys were showing up for the first time. So, yeah, this is uh, this is 20 years, and uh, I don't, it, it feels like this is probably not going to go away. It's one of those things where it, how else are you going to know how the team performs unless you see them enter a hotel and see what they're carrying, like what kind of uh, pillows, you know, how many... I think you can equate the number of TVs and video game systems brought in to the 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 lack of production from the team overall. And we haven't seen many of those over the last few years. Back in the day, back in Jim Trestle's time, you would see a TV sneak in there. You'd see like a, a PlayStation 1 maybe sneak in there at that point in time. Back in those days, maybe a Sega Dreamcast, something like that. I don't know. That may be a little further back. But it's it's our opportunity to feel like paparazzi and... There's no greater joy, Tom, than feeling like paparazzi. The highlight of that every year is the uh, the normies, the non-football folks who are walking <laughs> yes. into the hotel who are like, it, what, is the Queen of England staying here? What is going on? Is the, the is the president in town? Why is why is everyone here? It's like, well, there, there are football players. And so are they playing a game? No, they're just walking in carrying suitcases. Uh, but we're going to need these photos for editorial purposes throughout the year. So here we are. Yes. And so the reason we're talking about that is we've received the fall practice schedule, fall camp schedule, and we're going to run through that uh, number of practices, when they're practicing, and then also the availability schedule in terms of media availabilities, who we're talking to each day. And as we go through that, we will then ask some questions that, that we would like to have answered those days from those coaches. And it's not always... Uh, easy to ask questions during camp because coaches don't want to tell you anything. Coaches don't know anything until they've seen enough. And sometimes you, you're asking them at points where they haven't seen anything almost yet. So you have to be careful how you ask questions if you actually want answers. But so let's go through and look at this practice schedule. It, camp starts on the 4th on Thursday. They will have two practices and just helmets. And the first day of shoulder pads is practice three, which is the 6th of uh, August. Then they have, so they've got two practices in shoulder pads. And then first day of full pads is the fifth practice. You've got to have a five day acclimatization period. And so that's when the pads finally go on. That's August 9th. So it's five days after the first day of 
camp is when they will finally have full pads on, go you know, full contact as much as they will. But it's basically a Saturday to Monday to Saturday schedule, and they take Sundays off, essentially, and uh, practicing every morning. And then, you know, and then by week two, they'll be a really good team, and they can start game planning for Notre Dame. But we do have four viewing windows for camp. I know a lot of schools have all open practices. That would be, Ohio State used to have all open practices, I think until Jim Trussell won a national championship, and then he shut that down. But it would be great and also terrible, because like check-in day, if somebody's there, you got to be there. If we had open practices for 25 practices, we would have to be there all day, or every day, essentially all day. And while we would get a ton of information, it'd be a lot of work. It would be a lot of work. It, I think that's a problem I would be willing to have uh, just to sort of mix things up at this point. But, you know, it, it you get a chance to see them a little bit. We'll have, uh, like you said, four viewing windows, and you know, two of them are in the first week when we're, we're seeing them Thursday and Friday this week, which is, you know, there, there's only kind of marginal utility in seeing them during, uh, you know, when they're just just in helmets and shells for the most part. They're not doing a whole lot of, uh, oh, you know, a whole lot of, uh, you know, eleven on eleven stuff or anything like that. So you just kind of get a little sense, and you start, you, know, you can get some photos of some of the new guys and all all that kind of fun stuff. But yeah. Later in the later in the uh, later in the camp, August eleventh, Big Ten camp, uh, fall camp tour day uh, on Thursday the eleventh, and then Monday the fifteenth, our last chance to see them before the season. So you know, it'll be it'll be uh, interesting. And what one of the things that I think we generally will track throughout the camp because you don't have super long windows generally. A lot of times you're just seeing the first few periods before they start doing any kind of tackling drills, any type type of one on one kind of stuff. One of the things we're big things we're looking for is what order are they going through drills in? Because generally, the order that they're going through drills in is a pretty good indication of of the order that guys are in the depth chart. You know, the, Zach Harrison is probably going to be going through a lot of the defensive end drills at the start of the you know on the front of the line. Tyler, you know, where is Tyler Friday in that line? Is Tyler Friday is he ahead of uh, JT Tuimolo on the line, or is he behind JT Tuimolo on the line? That's a good way to kind of figure out some of that stuff. And then you see it week one, and then you see it a couple weeks later. Okay, now you've gone, you know, from practice one to practice seven. Has the order changed? Is, you know, are guys moving in different, you know, are guys repping in different orders? That kind of stuff can be very instructive just to kind of give you an idea where guys are maybe on the depth chart and who's, you know, potentially making a move up the, uh, up the, uh, up the line. And then sometimes you'll find out, oh, yeah, this guy is just kind of being held out of practice today for something really minor. And, uh, you know, what, what you saw doesn't necessarily mean anything, but uh, it, it's some, sometimes it means a lot. Sometimes it doesn't mean anything. And you kind of just got to pay attention and watch and, and look for a bunch of little things like that in order to sort of figure out what, uh, you know, what what you can take away from some of these practices. That's why it's so difficult, because we will get to see some of that first practice. And everybody's going to make their judgments and write up their reports. But it's just one little glimpse of one practice. And you that this has to be like your your control and your, um, you know, your findings. And it's like, well, that's not really how it's just one practice. You need to see others to have more information and see what certain stuff means. And that's why I do like you, you see another practice 10 days later and you see, oh, Caden Curry is now repping in front of Javante Jean, Jean Baptiste, or you know, wow, look at Car- Carson Hinsman is now battling for the second team left tackle. You can see guys move up, and e- that that's without even necessarily getting to see them in any type of scrimmaging. You, know, you the more practices you can see, the better uh, suppositions you can make, I guess. Because a lot of it is just, you know, this. I think this is what this means based on seeing it before and having it play out accurately, semi accurately in the past. So these are the, the judgments I'm going to make. But the more you can see that, then you can make uh, more definitive thoughts and, and then convey them to the people to let you know, hey, this is what's happening, as far as I know. Yeah, it is, it is a little bit of informed speculation. But, in, over the, you know, after, after doing this for a while, you sort of 
get a sense for what maybe is meaningful and what maybe isn't meaningful. So that's, uh, you know, you can sort of separate the wheat from the chaff a little bit, a little bit that way. And then of course we get to talk to the players and coaches too, but, uh, you know, some of the, some of the value in that is dependent on when during the camp you actually get to talk to these guys because you can, you know, you can talk to them too early and then, I mean, Tony, we're going to get to talk to uh, Coach Tony Alford this Friday. How much is Coach Tony Alford going to have to say about the running backs and who's, who's you know, improved where and all that when they haven't put their shoulder pads on yet? Yeah, and and that's the thing. You – We'll, we'll we'll run down the schedule because we've got we've got some questions that we want to ask, but it's very much there are positions you would rather see that first or second interview session because, and and I think maybe running back is good is a good one in that second interview session where they've only had two practices and no pads. It's like I think we have a pretty good idea of what is going on at running back, so having them very early, I'm okay with that. Uh, I know in the past where there's a quarterback battle and they're like the first or second interview session, it's like this is a complete waste because you want to know who's leading, who's doing this, how's everybody looking, and the answer is always, Tom, what's the what's the answer? I mean, it's way too early to give you any kind of answer on that. I mean, we we just barely, we're just, they're just trying to figure out where the locker room is at this point, and boy, they don't, you know, yeah, they we haven't we haven't seen him when you know we haven't seen him in pads yet. And boy, until you see him in pads, you really don't have any idea what you're. Yeah, and and quarterbacks were very traditionally always the first ones, which you know that that's the one. I mean, I probably don't need to explain to an audience of Ohio State fans. An awful lot of times, uh, an audience of Ohio State fans is maybe most interested in the quarterback race, uh, especially if it's an open competition. And then uh, that's the only time you get the quarterbacks. And then it's like, well, I I guess we'll I guess we'll all find out together in a month. It'll be great. And this year where there are, I guess, very few quarterback questions, we get them towards the end of the run after practice 13, which, you know, it, it's fine, and we'll have some questions there. But, Tom, let's go through each of these interview sessions, and, and I'll let you know who, who we're planning to talk about. And we'll each just throw out a question that we would like to have answered. And the way you have to ask these questions is you have to know these are questions that we would like to have answered that we think will be answered. Um, because you can ask plenty of questions that will never be answered. These are questions at the time that you think will get answered. It doesn't mean they will. But Thursday, August 4th, after the first practice, we talked to Ryan Day. And that's the only person we talked to. And that's fine. We don't need a position group after first first practice. So what is something that you would like to have answered after that first day from Ryan Day? I think I'd like to know where his biggest concern is or biggest you know question mark or most uncertainty, which position group on each side of the ball. I feel like on offense in the spring, the answer was the, you know, sort of the depth at offensive line. I'd be interested to know, is that still the same thing on defense? Is he concerned about the line? You know, where, where's the biggest question him? Is it linebackers? Is it safeties? Where does he think, you know, there's the most up for grabs during, during fall camp? I think that's maybe just in terms of setting a baseline. I think that's maybe the best, the best thing to ask uh, day one. Funny. Cause I have that later on as well. And that'll be something that gets covered throughout. Probably every time he talks, my question will be, "Hey, why wasn't so and so there?" And now this may not get answered, but it's always one of those things like, "Well, we didn't see, we didn't see Teron Vincent at practice, something like that. We didn't see this guy because you're also running through. Uh, some of us are running through a mental checklist. Other people carry actual checklists, like our buddy Dan Hope at Eleven Warriors. You know, like we should do that, Tom. I'm just saying we should do this where you have actual list of players. I may have done it once, and it's it's still a lot to keep up with." Because you you're, you can only see so much, but you know who's not here, and that's always a thing. And if it's injury related, you know he's not going to tell you what that injury is, but uh, he 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 will give you an idea of how long somebody is out, or if if it's a concern, or if it's like oh no, it's fine, then it's you know maybe it's just a week or it's a couple of days. So I, that's always one of the top questions: is hey. We we noticed he wasn't out there. Is there anything with that? Is it, is it classes? Is it what? And it won't be classes until what, like August twenty third or so. So if they're not out there early on. Why not? Yeah, Park, Parker Lewis is probably someone who will potentially be looking for on Thursday. Kicker transfer from USC, who's kind of caught in the NCAA transfer limbo. He's someone who will probably you know that that'll be one interesting thing to keep an eye on. Is he out there yet? And if not, what's what's the latest on him? Because Ohio State just went through this with Paula Ea Naoteote last year. 
another USC transfer, ironically enough, where it just sort of stuck in NCAA transfer limbo until Indianapolis decided to do something about it. And how long will that last this year? We'll find, we all get to find out together. Uh, so then the next session is the follow that, that Friday after practice number two, we talked to Tony Alford and the running backs. I think my, my question going into this or coming out of it after two practices, and I don't know that the answer will be there just yet, but I'm interested to know how Justin Fry's offensive line and some schemes that he has brought in impacts the running backs. Who does it fit best? Who is maybe uh, excelling with it more? And, and you can base that on spring as well, but maybe who is it better suited for? Are there any struggles going on there? I don't know that I'll really get an answer in terms of who, who's excelling, who's struggling. But I think there's some scheme stuff that Tony Alford will talk about if if there's anything there to talk about. So that's just one of the things I'll, I'll have interest in knowing at that point. Yeah, that, that's a good one. I would be interested in kind of knowing I think, you know, Dallin Hayden, the answer on any Dallin Hayden question is going to be, it's too soon to say, because Dallin Hayden was not in for spring. So any Dallin Hayden question you ask is is going to be kind of a waste this early in camp. So I think to me, the question is, biggest area where the three guys have all improved since this time last year, maybe since spring camp, where have, where have Trey Van Henderson, Mayan Williams, and Evan Pryor maybe made the biggest gains, each of those guys? And where are they still, you know, what, what's the stuff that they're really focused on working on, you know, in the coming weeks, in the lead up to the Notre Dame game? You might get an answer to the first half of that question. I feel like you're more likely to get an answer to the first half of that question. Sometimes the second half of that question is like, well, I don't want to tell you that because that'll, you know, that we're, we're still, still trying to save stuff for Notre Dame. And there are specific answers to that question you could give that would not tip anything off to Notre Dame. But there is a uh, par- paranoia is a, a uh, dominant gene in the uh, college football coach uh, DNA, especially with a game as big as Notre Dame to start the season. So half the time you're not going to get an answer, even if it's a question that's like, you should be able to give me, give me an answer on that. But th- the first part of that, I think you could probably could get, get an answer on uh, from Tony Alford. It's always fun to talk to Tony Alford because he has a, a kind of a fatherly, a, a, a playful fatherly relationship with his players and he jokes about them. He um, rags on them and maybe, maybe a good question will be like, what's something that you make fun of Dallin Hayden about, you know, <laughs> where it's like, what is something that you enjoy teasing him about? Cause he does love talking about his players and, and their quirks and his quirks. And it's always interesting to just get the, um, the personality of the incoming players as well. So then following practice for Monday, August 8th, we will talk to Justin Fry and a bevy of offensive linemen. Tom, what is something that you want answered following that practice? I, I feel like a lot of the questions I would want answered from him, I'm not necessarily going to be able to get answered from him because you're not, you know, you're you're probably not at the point where the backup guys are necessarily have solidified themselves. I guess I'd be interested in someone like Josh Fryer, who he has not, he didn't get to see in the spring because he was hurt. How is Josh Fryer progressing? How confident are you in Josh Fryer right now? Has he, you know, are you starting to see the stuff that you would feel comfortable with him being, you know, being one of the top six, seven, eight guys on that line? Because he didn't get to see him in the spring. I'd be interested in that. I'd maybe be interested in, you know, some of the other young guys, Zen Mahalski, George Fitzpatrick. You know, or have or have either of them kind of really kind of caught your eye in terms of a jump between spring and now? Because those are both guys who I think we looked at the spring as you know, kind of put put a pin in this, but keep an eye on this guy kind of thing. So yeah, either either Fryer coming off the injury or some of those guys who are just kind of you know, have they have you seen a noticeable leap from any of those guys since the spring? Yeah, I think that's that's about where I am as well, and we'll get to see glimpses glimpses of two practices before this. So we'll have an idea. Like my question, now I want to know who's at tackle, who is at guard. That's, that's Josh fire. That's Enoch Vamahi. That's Ben Christman. That's all of these guys that are tweeners per se. So I would like to know who is where, but we might, we, we may already know that from the first week of practices, but this is the start of week two. So it, is everybody still where they are? Who's making a move, something like that. Cause this is four practices in, is it enough to be really be making a move yet? I don't know because they're not even in full pads yet. So it's a tough, it's a tough time to get 
this group, but they can at least, he can at least answer questions on, well, right now we've got this guy repping here, that we've got this guy repping here. We like him here for this reason. So I think we'll get some base answers on who is where. We should be able to form a two deep, even if he will never tell us, which I'm assuming he will never tell us. Yeah, that that's generally a safe bet. You know, you're not going to get you're not going to get a real good in injury report. You're not going to get a real good two deep. Uh, even when they put out an official two deep, it's always a little. It's like mm, there's there's more wars on here, uh, more a little more obfuscation than there probably needs to be. I have a feeling you know who the starter at this place is, and there's uh, you know it, it's maybe not quite as clear cut uh, on the paper as it is on the field or uh, in reality. So. Yeah, don't don't uh, don't rely on coaches to tell you a whole lot of stuff uh, three to four weeks before a uh, top 10 uh, season opening showdown. Yeah, I, I don't know if Al Washington ever told us who his starters were. And that was when, you know, it was Pete Warner starting every week. Um, so then Tuesday, August 9th is the next session following practice number five, which is Jim Knowles and the linebackers. I I think. Now this is practice five, first practice in pads. The defense has been installed. It's getting continued to be installed. I would like Jim Knowles answer on what should we expect from Tommy Eichenberg this year? Because he is a kind of a, a, we see him as a throwback middle linebacker type and the throwback middle linebacker type is not necessarily in vogue in college football anymore. And when you're in a spread defense as Ohio state is, he seems, I don't know, like uh, anachronistic in a sense. And so he can't just be this north-south guy that is just this run plugger. So what should we expect from him? And everything he said about him in the spring was that he is he can run all over the place. So um, I, I'd like to know if, if that still holds true. That That's a good one because I think he's someone who you kind of felt like got the starting job towards the end of last year, almost by default when Cody Simon got hurt. I'd be interested to know how Cody Simon looks. Cause he's another guy who Jim Knowles really didn't get to see him this spring. I don't think he, he practiced a whole, whole heck of a lot. Didn't play in the spring game. And, you know, I'd be interested. What, what are his impressions of Cody Simon now that he's getting a chance to really see him on the field? And again, this is still relatively early in camp. You're about a week in. So you're still a little bit on the early side, but it, you know you you at least have you've probably seen more of him in, in the last week than you had on the field in his whole time in Columbus. Before that, the other guy I'd really be interested in is is how is Chip Trainum picking things up? Like how quickly is Chip Trainum picking you know picking up the defense, picking up the responsibilities of being a linebacker? He was in for spring. You would expect from spring to the start of fall camp and a week into fall camp, that's where you're starting to get into. You know, things are sort of, you're sort of starting to slough off some of the guys who are not, uh, you know, not going to be, you know, regular contributors. You're, you're getting a little more focused in terms of your reps and all that kind of stuff. You're not quite into game prep yet, but you're, you're kind of getting a little more focused. Is Chip Trainum in that group of guys who's getting kind of the more reps? Is he, has he progressed to the point that he can get, be in that conversation? Or is he maybe, you got to kind of just like, okay, set, set him aside. He's not going to be one of the top four guys, something like that, where does he kind of fall? Is he is he in the yes group or the no group, you know, as you sort of get a little more serious about things moving into camp? Yeah, does Jim Knowles see enough out of him, his athleticism and his abilities to where, well, i got to find something for him because he can do something. Now I've got to find out how he can help us and, and, and put him into a position to do that. So two days after we talk to Jim Knowles, we will talk to Ryan Day again, just Ryan Day. That's following practice seven on Thursday, August 11th. Tom, what is something that you will want to hear from Coach Day following the seventh practice of fall camp? You're about halfway through now, and, you know, so you can't you can't really say it's, you know, we're just, we're, it's too early, we're just getting started. This is, this is kind of, you remember earlier we talked about kind of the, you want to see where guys are day one, and then you want to see where guys are, you know, the next time we see them, you, you get to see where they are. This is kind of a temperature check to me. Okay, we're a week in. You, last week you were concerned about fill in the blank. How you know how how different are you are has your you know your opinion on that changed? Is that something you're less concerned about, more concerned about? Is that you know what has what has changed over the course of the last week? And you know maybe we're we're talking to him again again uh, 
on the following Monday. So maybe this is the following Monday question instead of a Thursday question. But at some point, that's that's what I kind of want to know. I want to see the sort of the progression through fall camp. Is he is he still concerned about the same stuff at the you know halfway through as he was on day one? If he is, well, that, that's a problem. If there's you know been some progress and specific guys are maybe stepping up, well, that that you know if you have solved your biggest problem halfway through camp, like well, that's a pretty good sign for things uh, things to come. So that that's one of, that's something that I would be interested in asking about. You know, either either on that day or maybe the following Monday. I could argue, Tom that if he always has a different answer each week to what the biggest problem is, there might be a lot of problems. There's that, yes. <laughs> so it's, well, last week, you know, we thought it was the running backs, but it turns out this week it's the tight ends. And then, you know, Brian, you said last week it was the tight ends. Like, I know, I thought it was the tight ends. Turns out it's the safeties. I got to go, guys. Uh, so if it's just a different problem each week, um, that would also be uh, an issue. The, the key is uh, stop having problems. Stop having concerns. Maybe just don't don't care so much, maybe, right? Tony Gerderman, college football consultant. Stop having problems. Oh, wow. That's that's great advice. I don't you're uh you know, one of the one of the two greatest Tonys to ever be a motivational speaker, that's for sure. That's uh it's great great stuff. Make that uh, one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars out to cash. <laughs> <laughs> My question at this point after practice seven is how much longer do you let the backup quarterback competition go on because at some point you've got to nip it in the bud and get the second team quarterback. You got to get the backup quarterback ready for Notre Dame. So I think you can let it go two weeks because you've got four weeks of camp, but you know, once they start getting ready for Notre Dame and game planning fully, then you need to know basically who all of your backups are at that point, I think, and get them ready to play. So I'll just want to know like how much longer are you going to let it go? Do you need to go, let it go any longer? Because you know, do you, I'm sure they feel like it's Kyle McCord, but how long do you let Devin Brown try? And obviously you want him to continue to try, but how long do you um, drag him along, lead him on, something like that? Yeah, that, and, you know, I think that's one that I maybe ask a little further on into the, you know, that that might be one that I'm I'm waiting another week to ask on uh, August 18th when we're talking to Corey Dennis. Because it feels like you're still, I mean, even if it's, uh, you know, Monday, August 15th, you're still only a week and a half into camp. You still got a couple weeks before the game. I mean, real two and a half weeks before the game. I, I think that's more of a, you know, like when we talk to the quarterbacks, that's kind of when you sort of expect them to have an answer on that. They they have to make a decision. I mean, if you're wondering why, you get to a point where you have to give, you know, there's only so many reps. CJ Stroud's going to get a lot of reps. A lot of times it's 60-30-10 uh, or something like that in terms of, the reps for first, second, and third team. The difference between 10% of reps and 30% of reps, that's pretty significant. And you need to have that backup quarterback, uh, you know, in, because you you are always one snap away. And, you know, you need to have that backup quarterback ready. And you need to have a bunch of reps to, to get that guy ready. So, yeah, th that's the reason you have to have it, have uh, have that kind of squared away. But, you know, I mean, you could, you could, they could figure that out anytime during that week. and. Still, you know, you still got a couple weeks of camp left before you're really getting into game prep. So we will then have the weekend off. It's a four day weekend, and the next time we talk to Ohio State will be the Monday following Monday, August fifteenth, following practice ten, and that's talking to Ryan Day again, and that's talking to Kevin Wilson and the tight ends. Uh, in terms of getting back to then Ryan Day, Tom, what are you asking him? Ryan, we just talked to you on Thursday. Why don't we space these out a little better? Uh, that, <laughs> Talk to Jerry about that. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you're getting to the point where I don't know how much of an answer you're going to get on this, but you're getting to the point where they're working more against the defense. So I'd kind of be interested in his impressions of the defense, what kind of different challenges they're presenting you know, how much that helps in terms of preparing C.J. Stroud and, and the rest of the offense for the season, how much it, it helps prepare the offensive line for the season. You're maybe you're getting some more unpredictable looks and some more, you know, non-traditional looks from that defensive front. I, I think I'd be interested in that because you're, you know, now you're far enough into camp that they're not just doing one-on-one -on -one stuff. They're probably doing a lot of, they've probably done a scrimmage at this point. Like, I, I would be very interested in what the defense has done 
and been able to do against this offense because I think the assumption would be the offense is going to dominate pretty much every defense. So how is the offense doing against the defense right now? Yeah, I think this would probably be the the pr- first practice after their first scrimmage because I don't they won't have a scrimmage the first week. And so this would be uh, the first Monday after the second week. So I think that Saturday would be a scrimmage practice. I would ask Ryan Day a question that he hates getting, which is something like, you know, so who is standing out right now? Give us a young guy who's standing out or give, give us a veteran who's standing out because then he always says, well, I don't want to do that because I'll forget somebody. But then if he does end up like giving a name, a name like he's like, well, you know, Denzel Burke is really doing well. Then I will follow up with, I noticed you didn't say anything about Cameron Brown. Is there an issue there? That way he will never answer these questions ever again because not only uh, he doesn't want to leave anybody out, but then if you push him on something and say, hey, you know, you've said a name, but you didn't say this name. Should, is there a concern there? Still on the team? Something of this nature? Is he in trouble? Doghouse? You know, what, what's going on there? And then um, never have to ask, uh, answer another one of my questions again because I'll never be called on again. Talking to Kevin Wilson, then I would like to know, do you have a second do it all tight end? And maybe, maybe the better question is, do you have a first do it all tight end? And what is this? um, How compartmentalized are these guys? Can you do everything you want to do with Kate Stover and Joe Royer? Can you do everything you want to do with Kate Stover, G Scott, so on and so forth? Can you do everything you want to do with any of the two guys at this point? And, you know, I, I think that's a very, Big question for this offense, and uh, you know that's that's ten practices in. We should have a good idea, I guess. You should, and the fun thing about Kevin Wilson is Kevin Wilson will give you answers to questions you won't necessarily get answers to from other coaches. You know, similar similar questions you'll kind of get a brush off answer. Kevin Wilson will sometimes just kind of answer you. He is uh, he's someone that I think we we all look forward to talking to because you always you always feel like you learn something talking to Kevin Wilson. I, I would be interested in. You know, and this this may be a truth serum question, and I don't. Maybe you're not getting the full answer, but you might get it from Kevin Wilson. How many of the tight ends are you comfortable with from a blocking perspective right now, playing against Notre Dame? Because I feel like that's going to be, you know, that's going to tell me a lot about G. Scott. That's going to tell me, you know, are they comfortable with Joe Roy as a blocker? I think they will be. Cade Stover, I think, is kind of the free space in the bingo card there, along with Mitch Rossi. But you've got a bunch of other guys. You got Sam Hart. You got. Bennett Christian, like how many of these guys are you comfortable with purely from a blocking perspective? Because that's the ticket to the field. You know, catching passes is great. If they don't think you can block, you can't play tight end at Ohio State. So I feel like that maybe tells me more about the depth chart on the whole and and who they really, you know, who is in that circle of trust already at the tight end position. And that's something that you're not asking the rank guys or anything like that, but you know, that that might tell you more about who really is likely to get snaps at the beginning of the year than almost anything else. Yeah, that's a good one. That's uh, I'm going to ask that one. Thank you very much. So the next day it's Larry Johnson and the defensive line. And I don't believe we got an opportunity to talk to Larry Johnson in the spring. I think that may have gotten scrapped at some point. So this is following practice. I know we didn't. Practice. This is following practice number 11, Tom. What I'm going to ask, what I want to know is, has Zach Harrison gotten a bad rap? This is a guy where everybody keeps waiting for him to be this great player. Is, does Larry Johnson view him as, is, is he a great player? Like, Larry Johnson knows what he wants from him. And is he getting that? And so I, you know, when you, when you ask these questions to where you're looking for maybe some sort of criticism, Coaches are, are kind of reticent to do that at times. And Larry Johnson loves all of his players. They're all great. They all have incredible toolboxes. They're all outstanding. They do everything they're asked. But you know, I'm, you know, everybody keeps saying they're waiting for Zach Harrison. Is 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 he already um like has he already burst onto the scene basically? And maybe we just didn't know it. That's a good one because I, I and I feel like you kind of know the answer you're going to get already because he's you know he's gonna he's gonna say yes he's gonna be you know effusive with his praise for Zach Harrison and that's the tricky thing because I I would really love to know what does Tyler Friday look like after missing a year you know because he could be anything from 
you know, a, a Tyreek Smith level impact, or he could, if he's not a hundred percent healthy and not all the way back, it might be something less than that. I, but I don't think you're going to get an answer to that question, or at least, you know, a really, you know, maybe it's going to be a positive answer. Yeah. But I don't, you know, it, it, that could be a very a forthright positive answer. That could be a positive answer because he's going to give you a positive answer. I really am kind of most interested in the second year interior guys. Cause I feel like Tui Boloa, you kind of know what you're going to get. I feel like Jack Sawyer, you kind of know what you're going to get. I, I want to know Tyleek Williams. How far has Tyleek Williams come from last year to this year? Cause last year you sort of had the pieces there. You had the, the ability there and it was just, effort and consistency are you what are you seeing from him what are you seeing from mike hall on the inside are those two second year guys in the inside you know have you have you seen enough that there you trust them to be you know significant contributors this year he has tom he has uh, they're all they're all outstanding everybody on the defensive line so two days after that thursday august 13th following august 18th following the 13th practice of fall camp we get to talk to Corey Dennis and the quarterbacks. And this is a situation where CJ Stroud is the guy. Kyle McCord has a starting experience. Devin Brown shouldn't be expected to be uh, in, in the mix. So my question for Corey Dennis is, is Kyle McCord ready to start? Like, not that he's the starting quarterback, but if you need him right now, can he go? And that's, that, is he ready to start against Notre Dame? Because that's what you need from your backup quarterback. You need them to be ready to start game one. Where is Kyle McCord on that? And any and, and again, you ask these court coaches questions like this. Oh, they're we love our guys. They're all good. They're ready. They've put the work in. And uh, but still, it's a question that needs to be asked because it's it's something that needs to happen. Yeah, th- that's the question that I think. You know, you, you pump them full of truth serum and you ask that question. I don't, you know, that that's a great question. I don't think you're going to get a great answer necessarily on that. Or at least an answer that I would put, you know, 100% stock in. But it's, I think that that really is kind of the most pressing question for the quarterback group this year. And that's kind of along the lines of what I was, what I was thinking about asking. This is, I think, the point where you really have you, you know, are you sort of set with who's, you know, who's number two, who's number three? Is Kyle kind of in that number two spot right now, because this is the point in the camp where you, they have to have a decision. Now you've got to, you can't push that another week. And and I think Devin Brown probably recognizes he's likely going to be in, in that third string spot. As Kyle McCord is another, another, you know, another five-star quarterback. He has a year of a head start. It would be pretty surprising if Devin Brown was the number two at this point, because, you know, you would have to be, I think, pretty clearly head and shoulders above Kyle McCord because if Devin Brown enters the season number two, well, then Kyle McCord is number three behind a guy who's a year younger than him. And, you know, that that's sort of inviting, you know, an examination of the transfer portal, at least a consideration of the transfer portal. So, you know, I think any tie goes, you know, tie probably goes to Kyle McCord in this situation. And he's just, he's got a year more experience. He started a game. And I, I think he's going to probably be the number two on his own merits. But it would be, I mean, it would be very surprising to me if he wasn't the number two. And if, if Devin Brown is the number two, I mean, if Devin Brown's the number two, how remarkable does Devin Brown have to be in order to be the number two, you know, at this point in fall camp? I, I almost can't see a scenario where the three guys are healthy and he's the second string guy. Yeah, that's, you're going to, he's going to have to play so well that you're okay possibly losing Kyle McCord. And that's, you know that that's a level that I would not expect from any true freshman or any necessarily a redshirt freshman or sophomore at this point. So then, uh, so then we go from Thursday talking to Corey Dennis to Monday, following the fifteenth practice, talk to Ryan Day and Jim Knowles, get an update on the offense. I assume get an update on the defense. What are you then asking Ryan Day? I think at this point, I'm kind of interested. We're, we're not, we still often talk to the wide receivers. And I, at this point, I am kind of dying to know what's going on with the wide receivers and who, you know, who are your top three right now? Season starts today. Who are your top three wide receivers? And I, again, I don't know that you're going to get a completely forthright answer. But, you know, are there three guys? Or, you know, if he names guys, does he name four guys? Does he name five guys? Does he name six guys? 
where you know wh where is the line there because i feel like you're probably going to have marvin harrison and jackson smith and jigba and julian fleming probably but is Emeka Igbuka in that group? Is Jaden Ballard in that group? Does he talk about Cam Babb in that group? Does he talk about one, you know, which of the true freshman wide receivers, which name does he say first? This is, you know, there's a lot of parsing that goes on here. Does he, you know, and he, he names, he names five guys and then he says Caleb Burton's name, or he says Kojo Antwi's name, whoever, whoever, you know, what, what names does he say in what order? You know, a lot of times you're just sort of parsing, kind of reading the tea leaves on something like that. I think that, to me, is at this point of camp going to be one of the great unanswered questions. I like that one. It's an opportunity to get a hint towards what's going on at receiver before we actually get the, the full download from Brian Hartline. My question, this is where I go to your biggest concerns. So what what's, you are now what, 10, 12, 12 days, 13 days two weeks or so uh, away, away from the Notre Dame game. Um, what, what's, what's the big concern right now? Where, where are you most worried? And uh, I guess how has that grown or decreased from the start of camp? So that would be my question for day. Here's a question I would ask Jim Knowles. I'd ask him the same question that you did that you asked Ryan day about the receivers. Hey Jim, which receivers have stood out to you? Because he's probably, more it does him no harm to mention some receivers because they're not going to be his players aren't going to be mad at him because they're not his players per se like he's not coaching like cam babb's not going to be mad like hey you didn't say my name like you know he doesn't he's not working with them so he doesn't have anybody's necessarily feelings to hurt but that would be something where when you hear him say a freshman name you're like oh okay this is somebody that has caught the defensive coaches defense coordinators eye that means something. Let's put that away. And then when we see that same player playing in the second quarter of game four, game five, and really starting to make a mark, then we can go back to that. And it's like, okay, all right. We, we kind of had a hint that this was coming. So I think that's, it's always interesting to get the, the opposing perspective on, on players from coaches and, and other players as well. I think that might be uh, an interesting one for Jim Knowles and it might catch him off guard enough that he would answer it. Yeah, that's a good one, and it's, it's a good way to approach that because you you get you know you you're going to get a you know an informed opinion on it, but it's not someone who's necessarily being super guarded about how he you know wh what's he going to say because if Jim Knowles doesn't mention a wide receiver to your point you know it's not you know <laughs> that doesn't that that's not going to create any friction in the room or anything like that. I, I at this point, I mean that that's a very good one, and I, I I like that I like that one a lot. I think I at this point would like to know. Okay, you're you're now the decent way through fall camp. Which of the true freshmen do you think you know? Do you think has a chance to contribute early in the year? And you know, I don't know that we know Jim Knowles well enough now to know if that's a question he's going to answer honestly, or if that's a question that's going to, well, I don't want to, you know, leave anyone out, but, you know, give me, give me two names of guys who you think could contribute on, you know, on the defense. Is that Caden Curry? Is that CJ Hicks? Is that Gabe Powers? I mean, is that Hero Canoe? Like who, who has, you know, started to show you what you need to see for them to be a contributor at some point, say first half of the season? Yeah, I want to know who is stepping up and how large rotations are going to be at each position and how he feels about rotating at those position as positions as well. So then the next time we talk to somebody is the, the following day, August 23rd, Tim Walton in the corners and Perry Aliano in the safeties. And Tom, for the, the sake of uh, brevity, let's just uh, one question for the secondary. What are you uh, What are you looking to get answered here? I want to know how Lathan Ransom is progressing at this point of fall camp. You know, I think I think you've got pretty much everyone is healthy. You know, I, I'd be interested to know, is Josh Proctor still on track? Is Court Williams still on track? I mean, you've got a lot of guys who've been banged up there. Lathan Ransom, though, I think is the guy who is entering fall camp with the biggest question mark where he's not 100% as of day one. So, okay, now, three weeks from now, he, you know, we've been sort of told to expect that he's going to be on track to play. 
where is he physically? Where is he in terms of picking up the defense, in terms of, of all that stuff? Is he someone that you expect to contribute to be in the rotation? And if so, where? Because, you know, he's he could fit a couple different spots in that safety rotation. So I, I would be interested just where where he is at that point. Yeah, that's a good one because, as you said, where is he physically? Where is he physically on the field? You know, which position? I think we need to know that. Um, and also maybe just like every day there should be a health check for the safeties. Is everybody practicing? Everybody okay? Ligaments all there? Stuff like that. Um, I would I would ask Tim Walton, how many corners can you play? How many corners are you expecting to play? Everybody loves Jordan Hancock and J.K. Johnson. Are they going to play? Is this going to be a true rotation? Is this something he's even interested in doing? But I think you have to get those guys on the field because one of them is going to be starting next year. Uh, assuming they don't, one of them doesn't end up starting this year due to some something unforeseen. But you've got to get them ready, and uh, if they're ready, then are they going to play? So that's something. I think by August twenty third, sixteen practices, they should be able to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These guys are going to play. I don't know if they'll tell us how much, but. Yeah, they they should be able to answer. Will they answer? Well, <laughs> maybe. Again, we don't, you know, Tim Walton, Perry, Eli, Pelli, Perry Eliano, we don't necessarily know exactly how guarded they're going to be at this point where you're a week and a half out from the game. I, I think the default, the default assumption with pretty much any coach is they're going to be pretty guarded, especially in the lead. You know, you're not, you're not opening with Arkansas State. You're opening with Notre Dame. I... I think you probably could get an answer on that, but I don't know that you necessarily will. You know, well, we're still, we're still, you know, lots of guys are going to play. Like it feels, <laughs> it feels like you might, you might get yeah. one of those, which yes, is always, always a possibility. Yeah, and what does play mean? Does that mean seven snaps, or does that mean forty-seven snaps? You know, like that's oh, well, that's to, to be determined. Yeah, thank you for attending our TED talk. So the final, the the final availability is August twenty-fourth, following practice number seventeen. Brian Hartline and the receivers and Parker Fleming and the special teams. The question I, I want to know is from Hartline, how deep is the rotation? How many is it going to go legitimately? Like where it's six starters like in 2014, 2015, 2013, or is it four starters and then three guys also come in, that sort of thing. And when I say starters, guys that play roughly the same number of snaps between 50 and 70, something like that. They're all you know, in that group. I also still selfishly, personally, I just tell me more about Caleb Brown. How's he looking? I want to know about him. He's different than anybody else on the roster. He can do different things. How's he doing? What's he look like? Or, or any of the freshmen. And Brian Hartline can be difficult sometimes in getting him to talk about specific players unless you ask specifically about that player. Like if you're saying, give me some guys who are standing out, that's not that's not how it's going to work for him. You've got to like ask if you want, if you want to know about Caleb Brown, ask about Caleb Brown. I think that's my best advice for uh, trying to get answers from Brian Hartline. That, that's a, that's a good one. I think that's, that is also a sound strategy. I, I, the one, the question I was going to ask is how deep is your rotation? So I think that's, I think you've covered that one. So that, that's the question I may be most interested in. I, I kind of, at this point also, you know, you're a week and a half out from the game. I want to know how Cam Babb's looking. I am, you know, I am, I am, I am rooting for Cam Babb. I hope Cam Babb gets on the field. I hope Cam Babb get, you know, can stay healthy and and play this fall. I I would be very, and you know, I think that's someone who Brian Hartline is going to, uh, you know, if things are going well, I think Brian Hartline is not going to be shy about telling you that uh, he's he's very excited about Cam Babb and you know very helpful for Cam Babb. So that's that's another one. Uh, as you know, and then Parker Fleming and the special teams. I feel like I've got about four different questions here and uh you know we'll we'll do our uh, we'll do our uh you know most interesting questions for the special teams uh, episode of the the uh Buckeyes tomorrow morning on Monday next week but I think there's going to be some overlap there. I want to know how the kicking situation's working out. If you've got three scholarship kickers, who's doing what? Who is you know, do you have a kickoff guy and a long field goal guy and there's also the short field goal guy? Do you, you know, how are you, how are you dividing that up? I want to know who's your kick returner. I want to know who's your punt returner, who, you know, because it feels like you're probably working in some of the young guys and which of the younger, you know, which of the true freshmen is working at kick return or punt return? Because that tells me that has in the past been a decent proxy for which of these guys is maybe most explosive with 
guys is maybe most likely to get on the field fairly early. And then finally, another related question, not the sexiest question. Tony, tell me about your gunners. Tell me about your punt gunners. That's something who, you know, is is that a, is that Jaden Ballard? We saw Jaden Ballard working at punt gunner at one point in the spring. Is, you know, is he one of those guys? Is it some of the true freshmen? Because that's a position where it is not the glamour position, except at Ohio State, it kind of like low key is the glamour position. That's a spot where lots and lots of guys who have, are making lots and lots of money in the NFL right now kind of made their names as punt gunners at Ohio State. Terry McLaurin was a fantastic punt gunner at Ohio State and now making $30 million a year or whatever it is. So I, I, that's another one where that kind of tells me. That tells me a lot of other stuff other than just who's the punt gunner. Uh, that you know that that's generally a decent proxy for probably going to be a future impact player as well. I think Mickey Marotti said in the spring that the fastest player on offense was Jaden Ballard, fastest player on defense was J.K. Johnson. So maybe you know those are two guys to to start out with. Uh, my question is the same as last year: Is this the year that Ohio State returns to kickoff for a touchdown? And <laughs> Parker Fleming will say the same thing he did last year. I hope so. We're trying. Um, <laughs> I can't wait for one of your your questions will be something like, uh, well, it'll, it'll be like, hey, either you're either saying this to Fleming or to Jesse Mirko, but um, you guys know you didn't kick any, you had no touchbacks for punts, punts for touchbacks last year, right? You guys know that. That's amazing. And then when the Notre Dame game gets here, there's, there's going to be like three punts that are, you know, for touchbacks. And it's going to be like your fault. <laughs> they're so, they're so they're like, oh, I didn't realize that. That's pretty good. We're awesome at that. And then they'll go into this Notre Dame game thinking, yeah, we could pin these guys. We'll pin them back. And then like three times the punt rolls into the end zone. The first time, the first time it'll be a touchback and they'll glare at me. The second time it'll be a touchback. They're going to point at me. And the third time, Jesse Marco is just going to hit me in the head behind the end line with the punt. Just <laughs> son of a, yeah, that's a, I probably won't lead with that. I will try, I will try not to jinx anything. Although, you know, if it does come up, I probably will bring up the fact that it did get me three points in the bowl predictions, which I'm no. sure they already know. But, no. uh, you know, I mean, Parker, uh, how many field goals are you guys planning to kick from the 17 and 34 yard lines? What? No reason. No. Is that? No, 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 no reason. I'm just curious. I think asking them questions related to gambling is frowned upon. Asking them questions related to bold predictions is expected. That is, it's welcomed, uh, frankly, but. Uh, Tom, anything else before I ask everybody to hit the bell, if you're watching on YouTube to, uh, to, uh, subscribe to this Buckeye Huddle channel and, uh, give us a rating, uh, leave a review post on there, uh, you know, give us some comments, leave some comments, all that good stuff. Tom, anything before I mention that, anything else? I think this would be a great time to just remind people to hit the thumbs up, leave us a comment, uh, hit the bell, subscribe to the channel. I think this would be a good time for you to do that. So why don't you, why don't you go ahead and do that? Thank you all for doing that. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Sorry we kept you so long. We, we really like talking about interviews. Uh, we love media availabilities. This is, this is a, a thing near and dear to our hearts. I apologize if it was, it was completely not important to you guys. Very important to us. Maybe, Tom, maybe we just keep the show for us. Maybe we don't even release it. This is just something that we can listen to back and forth. Tony, how long did we think the show was going to be when we started? We thought mm, 25, 30 minutes, maybe. Yeah. Mm, mm. yeah. Well, here we are 53 minutes in. So missed it no. by that much. Only double. <laughs> but Buckeye weekly bet the over. <laughs> there you go. No, no gambling time. No gambling. Uh, but that will do it for this episode. I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you for sticking with us through all of the craziness over the last, oh, however long, but, uh, Thank you all for everything, and we'll talk to you guys later.